This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Story Beat episodes are widely available at storybeat.net, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, and numerous other podcast apps and platforms. So won't you please take a moment to subscribe to Story Beat wherever you listen to podcasts. My guest today, Stephen J. Rubin, is a screenwriter, producer, film historian, author, documentarian, and promoter. He's recognized internationally as the world's leading authority on the James Bond movie series. He was the first writer to publish a book that examines the backstage world of 007 called The James Bond Films, a behind-the-scenes history. He followed that with The James Bond Movie Encyclopedia, the latest edition of which debuts this fall, 2020. If you're a James Bond fan, as I've been for my entire life, Steve Rubin's books are indispensable. Steve began his motion picture writing career when he acquired the theatrical remake rights to the ABC TV series Combat, subsequently selling his screenplay and the rights to Savoy Pictures and later Paramount. He made his producing debut for Showtime in 2002 on the baseball comedy Bleacher Bums, starring Peter Riegert, Brad Garrett, Wayne Knight, and Charles Durning. That same year, for the Hallmark Channel, he produced the true World War II drama Silent Night, starring Linda Hamilton, which was nominated for four Canadian Television Academy Awards. He served as executive producer on My Suicide, an indie teen dramedy that won the Best Picture Award in its class at the 2009 Berlin Film Festival, and 19 other Best Picture Awards around the world. You can find it currently on Netflix. He wrote, directed, and produced the documentary East L.A. Marine, the untold true story of Guy Gabaldon. In 2019, he served as executive producer on the documentary The Coolest Guy Movie Ever. Other books from Steve include Secrets of the Great Science Fiction Films, Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 2010, The Twilight Zone Encyclopedia, and The Cat Who Lived with Anne Frank, his first children's picture book, co-written with David Lee Miller. As a marketing executive with a specialty in publicity and promotion, Steve spent 25 years working on campaigns for over 150 movies and television series. So for all those reasons and many more, I'm truly delighted to welcome Stephen J. Rubin to Story Beat Today. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, the pleasure is all mine, trust me. So tell us a little bit about your background. Let's go back a bit. What was it that in the first place led you to pursue the life of a filmmaker and a documentarian and then an author of books that are based on research? I always loved history. I think that of all the classes I took in high school, college, uh, history classes always appealed to me. I liked facts. I liked dates. I was particularly interested in military history. Right. I remember vividly writing a paper in first year college on the Battle of Vicksburg. You know, people were turning 10, 12 page papers in. Mine was 57 pages. Oh. <laughs> your, your professor must have loved you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I went to UCLA, um, the history classes there were kind of dry. And I remember walking past a bulletin board in the men's gym for the ROTC department. I just kind of had to glance at their their courses. History of U.S. Naval operations in World War II, amphibious operations, uh, history of the U.S. Navy. I said, wow. So I enrolled in ROTC classes, even though I was not an ROTC kid. I had the longest hair of anybody in the class. I was in the (laughs) class with 30 midshipmen or whatever they were. And uh, I wrote a 97-page paper on the invasion of France at Normandy. So I, you could see that my interest in, in history and military history was very strong. So when I got out of college with a degree in history, uh, I was encouraged to write a book. And since you're supposed to write a book on something you enjoy, mm-hmm. I picked uh, three fields that were important for me, which is film, 
military and to a certain extent journalism because I was going to be interviewing filmmakers. So whereas a lot of young men and women go to film school, my film school training was interviewing some of the classic people who made the classic films. Uh, I spent three hours with John Sturges, who directed Ooh. The Great Escape and The yeah. Eagle Has Landed. I spent, uh, I spent, uh, it was kind of a progression. I didn't know anything about how to reach out to Hollywood, but I had a phone book. The first person I called in the Beverly Hills uh, phone directory was Edmund North, who had written Patton. He had also oh. written The Day the Earth Stood Still a few years before that. So he was, a, I'd go back to him later, but he introduced me to Robert Pyrosh, who created the television series Combat, mm -hmm. who wrote a movie called Battleground, which won the Oscar for Best Screenplay in 1949. Uh, Bob introduced me to George Seaton, who had directed a movie called 36 Hours with James Garner. It's a terrific World War II movie, espionage. And then on and on and on and on, I interviewed over 50 filmmakers and that became my first book. And then uh, I learned, uh, I had started to ride my bicycle up to Hollywood to go to a place called Larry Edmonds Bookshop. Oh, sure. The center of Hollywood uh, uh, history. And um, they had a little magazine on the rack there at that time called Cine Fantastique, which yes. uh, had a big cover story on George Powell. Now, I wasn't as aware of everything as obviously I am now, but I certainly knew who George Powell was. He directed, uh, you know, he directed the Time Machine. Actually, yes, he directed the Time Machine. He produced War of the Worlds. Uh, so I bought that magazine. And at that time, I was doing my first interviews for uh, Combat Films book, and I was interviewing a screenwriter named Ted Sherdeman. Ted Sherdeman had written uh, a very interesting movie in the 60s called Hell to Eternity, mm. which was the life story of Guy Gabaldon, who I would sub subsequently do a documentary on. But I always remembered that movie as a film that treated the Japanese like human beings. You know, growing up on television and, uh, you know, watching World War II movies from the 40s, the Japanese were always treated in, you know, kind of a cliche manner, and they were yeah. it's all very racist and anti uh, humanity and this movie was the story of a man who had grown up with Japanese Americans in East LA and uh, went off to fight when they were all shipped to the internment camps and because he knew some Japanese started to get them to surrender and the big story about Guy Gabaldon is he uh, he single-handedly captured 1100 Japanese on Saipan one of the bloodiest islands of the war so Ted uh, Ted's telling me about the screenplay he wrote for Hell to Eternity, which is the Guy Gabaldon story. And he says, you know, it kind of reminds me what I did on them. And I said, excuse me? He said, and this is long before the internet. I didn't know what his writing credits were. I, I had to go to the Academy Library sure. to find out what else he wrote. Well, he wrote one of my favorite films of all time, which is the giant ant movie, Them. Them. It was the second most successful film for Warner Brothers in the year 1954, Behind the High and the Mighty. So I wrote a letter to Fred Clark, the editor of Cine Fantastic magazine, asking him if he would be interested in an interview with Ted Sherdeman. And then he, he wrote back a very positive letter. He said, could you also possibly get the director, Gordon Douglas, which I did. And my article was published in the, let's see, that would have been 1974. And one of the key things is I was able to talk my way on the Warner Brothers lot, and I was able to get some behind the scenes stills from the making of them. No one had ever seen a behind the scenes still from them. Wow. And the reaction in the magazine from their fans, I mean, Cine Fantastic was not exactly Time Magazine. It was, you know, I had a few thousand people who read it, but they really were very excited to see my piece with those stills. So Fred uh, embraced the article, and then I asked him if he'd be interested in a retrospective piece on the day the earth stood still. And he said, oh, sure. And what happened was, and I got to Robert Wise, the director, obviously, I mentioned Edmund North earlier, who I'd interviewed for Patton, who wrote Day the Earth Stood Still. And I went up to Stanford, interviewed Julie Blaustein, who produced it. But I went over to the Fox lot, and once again, talked my way on the lot. And I'm in the art department, and they have literally a warehouse full of old filing cabinets. The guy walks up to me and hands me this key still book from the day the earth stood still. Whoa. So this is the book that the art department would use to build their sets from, or at sure. least keep track of what their sets were. He says, just take this and get it back to me when, I, <laughs> when you can. So I walked off the Fox lot with the key still book from the day the earth stood still, which by the <laughs> way, has a couple of shots 
of Gort, the silver robot, the mm -hmm. iconic robot, yes. with his visor up, and you can see Locke Martin's face. Wow. It's just, you know, it's kind of like the Rosetta Stone for a film historian. So it was experiences like this early on, the, the pure joy of finding unique history and being able to tell it to the masses that st stirred all the juices from my love of history from university and got me thinking that I could possibly have a career somewhere in the movies. Now, I learned early on that I could make virtually very little money doing it. Uh, <laughs> film historians, film historians uh, make less money than bartenders. I mean, if we get money at all. I mean, uh, Fred Clark, you remember I told you about those 97 page papers I was writing in college? Yeah. Well, I spent six months researching the day the earth still stood peace and, and Fred put it on the cover. It was my first cover story. You know, I didn't get paid really for that much. I think I got a hundred dollars and he would give me copies of the magazines to sell at science fiction conventions. Sure. So I'd have a table with all the issues that were then available of CFQ and make a few extra bucks on the side. So I was, I was making little bits of money and we're, we're, uh, while working as a telephone operator, I worked as a parking lot attendant. I delivered urine for a hospital supply, you know, the, the, uh, what the, fun. Test, the test results stuff around, uh, urine samples, not urine itself. Not, well, they were, they were really urine. <laughs> uh, just trying to make a living. And then those, those experiences of going to a science fiction convention, having a little table. By the way, in 76, I'm sitting at the Equicon in uh, LA airport, and a kid walks up to me, a blonde haired kid, and, and I showed him my day the earth is still, and I signed a copy for him because he was a fan. And then he signed a copy on, uh, on my things that he wrote, May the Force Be With You. Oh, okay. He says, you'll remember that phrase next year. And it was Mark Hamill. Wow. A year before Star Wars. Wow. And um, what's interesting is the year after Star Wars came out, I saw an ad in the Hollywood Reporter. Now, if you worked in Hollywood at that time, you had to read the trade papers. And I read them pretty much voraciously every day because it's kind of like the diary of Hollywood. And the sad thing today is even though we have all this internet news, we don't really have daily trade papers like we had in those days. And so there was an ad um, and the ad said, as I recall, uh, major studio looking for science fiction convention film coordinator to promote major movie. Wow. So I looked at that ad kind of double taped and I, I wrote, um, I wrote, I, I put my resume together. And then, uh, interestingly, the, the weekend before, there was a tribute to War of the Worlds up on Hollywood Boulevard, and they had taken a photograph of me standing there, and it was a nice photo, and I shoved it in the envelope, figuring having a photo of yourself that's kind of a nice photo isn't bad. It separates you from the pack. Well, I got the job. I don't know if the photo was the only thing that did it. Hopefully, my experience on the convention circuit did it, and I was hired by United Artists to promote the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh -huh. Ronald Sutherland, Leonard Nimoy, you know. Philip Kaufman. Philip Kaufman. And what happened, and Philip Kaufman, very closely, uh, close friends with George Lucas, Lucas had sent um, Charlie Lippincott around the country for a year before Star Wars came out to promote Star Wars on the convention circuit. And Phil told producer Robert Solo that they should do the same thing. They should get somebody to do that. So they hired me. And for about I'd say about eight or nine months, I went around the country. Uh, it was my first trips anywhere. I'd never really been anywhere. I moved to, I was born in Chicago. I moved to LA when I was four. Got my first trips to New York. I had three trips to New York, Philly, Pittsburgh. I was in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. I was in uh, Chicago, uh, all over the country and uh, promoting that movie, which actually uh, did pretty well that fall. It was uh, the, the big competition in the uh, winter of 78 was Superman, the original with Christopher Reeve. I remember. So that was the launching of a, another career for me in a sense. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but in, in marketing parlance, I was referred to as an advance man, which yeah. is a, somewhat of a PR function. When I came back from Europe, um, the uh, actually it was the previous summer, I, I was encouraged to um, leave my resumes at PR agencies. And after the Body Snatcher campaign, I was hired by a PR agency in Hollywood to be a publicist. 
Now, if you told me that I got a job surveying on the moon, I probably would have known more. I knew nothing about PR or PR writing or promotion, how to get clients on you know, for PR and publicity. But I learned under the hand of a wonderful gentleman named Stan Rosenfield and um, his uh, associate, Larry Goldman. And I really learned how to be a publicist. I worked in an agency. I was what they call an agency publicist. But I'll tell you, um, one day a, a lady walked in, her name was Phyllis Gardner, and she was what they call a unit publicist. Now a unit publicist is actually a crew function. You work on the film itself. If sure. the film goes to shoot in Taiwan, you go with it. And I was curious about what she was doing because she was working with a still photographer. She was writing press kits and stuff. So what happened was Phyllis became head of MGM publicity and she contacted me the following year and I guess the, the Bo Derek Tarzan movie that had shot in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. had fired most of their PR people. So they didn't have a press kit. So Phyllis hired me to write the press kit to interview Bo and uh, Miles O'Keefe, who played Tarzan, to put a press kit together. And then uh, the following, a few months later, Alan Rudolph was going to Wyoming to make a thriller called Endangered Species. And uh, it was kind of a Cold War thriller. Uh, about stealth helicopters and germ war toxins, and they needed somebody to go up to Wyoming for three months. So I was hired to be the unit publicist, and uh, it was a little daunting. I wasn't quite sure. Before I left, I took a publicist to lunch because you're supposed to, you know, learn a little bit about what you're doing from somebody who's done it a million times. He wasn't very helpful. The only, <laughs> the only thing he taught me was never interview an actor before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> why is that? Why, why don't you a interview actors before lunch? You know, it's a very good question. To this day, I'm not quite sure. And it, it's, of course, it's completely meaningless because if Entertainment Tonight comes out to your set at 10 a.m., they're not coming back after lunch. You got to right. interview them right now. So it made no sense whatsoever. And depending upon the actor, if, they, if it's someone who um, might like to uh, have some sort of alcoholic substance with their lunch, after lunch may not be a good idea at all. Very true. Also, people are a little more somnolent after lunch, you know. Yes, sure. Slow down quite a bit. I, I, anyway, I went up there and I, I kind of bumped my head a few times uh, on the, the, the job, but I spent three months in Wyoming. Became I, I just loved working with the actors. We had Robert Urich and Joe Beth Williams and Hoyt Axton and Paul Dooley and the, and the old time actors, Harry Carey Jr. and Gene Evans. And mm, it was yeah. just a total blast, kind of like summer camp. And it was the fall of 81. I just turned 30. Uh, it was a bit of a blast for me. And I would later work with Joe, Bill, Joe Beth Williams again on a film called Desert Bloom. But for the next 10 years, I was a feature unit publicist. I worked on films like Pretty in Pink for John Hughes. Right. Uh, and then they started hiring me as the guy who did the crummy sequel to a good movie. So <laughs> I did Porky's 2. I did Weekend at Bernie's 2. I did Eddie and the Cruisers too. I did Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, which was the sequel to Honey, I Shrunk the Kid. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and worked on a bunch of things and then um, got a job uh, at Showtime in 92. Uh, they were looking for somebody to be based in LA to actually coordinate hiring units. So I got out of the field, which was kind of a good thing for me because I'd left pretty much everybody behind. I, very, I didn't have any social life. I, I was always going out of town. They always sent Steve to the far corners. Um, so how so. much, how much did, would you say that, so you had early on found a love of history and research. That was something that, that has stayed with you for your whole career. How did the research and the history part of your education and your background inform your publicity? Did it help in some way? It's a very good question. Um, I, you know, I, I started my writing career writing for a college newspaper. I wrote for the UCLA Daily Bruin. I had a very good editor. Just, uh, just, so, just, of, so, you, just so you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Bruin graduate, graduate school. Oh, okay. So, so we we'll share start. that in common, yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think that um, I always thought of my writing style as kind of punchy, kind of coming out of journalism and news writing. So I think what happened with my publicity writing is I, I really adopted kind of a punchy cut to the chase style mm -hmm. that helped me. And in, my, in terms of my research background, uh, I, I was very careful to get to know the actors so I could write good biographies of them and good notes. Um, 
production notes back in the day were important to the publicity department at the studio. Being a unit, being a unit publicist is kind of an unusual job in the sense that nobody's paying much attention to you. Right. The studio generally is releasing movies at a clip of at least one a month. So they're not really thinking about a movie that's probably not going to go into release for another year. And on the set, they're making the movie. They don't know what you're doing. You know, if you're in the office, the people on the set are thinking you must be in the office working. I could be doing anything. I could have my feet up on the table. If I'm on the set, the people in the office figure I'm doing something on the set. I could have my feet on a chaise lounge. But I was always working. And I'll tell you, Steve, the first time I got on a film set, oh, my God, it was like I came home. I mean, I, you know, having studied film for years and written about films and talked to people. I'd never really been on film sets. I talked to them years after they had seen these, you know, made these classic movies. Here, I'm actually part of the making of the history of it. So right, it was, sure. it was it, I, I treated a film set kind of like hallowed ground for me. I mean, I treated everybody with respect, which is a cornerstone to being a good publicist. Mm. You know, if you've got Entertainment Tonight shooting an interview at lunch with your star, and you've got to ask the gaffer to leave a light on so there's a good background light as they go to lunch. If you don't have a relationship with that guy, he could easily tell you to go F off and take off and, you know, whatever. Yes, I made a of point course. of getting to know people. I also did things that other publicists were a little hesitant to do. Um, you have to work with the still photographer to make sure he's getting good stills. Often, because of the way the camera is set up and where the actors are, there's no room for the still photographer to move in and get a nice shot. So at times you realize the only way to get that cool still is when they call cut to ask the assistant director for 10 seconds so you can throw your photographer into the mix and get the shot. Well, I learned to do that. You know, I actually stood on the set with my arms full and said, we need 10 seconds. And they would give me the set, sometimes for a little longer than that. And I, I got a good reputation for that. And I, but I, again, I, I got to know everybody very carefully. Well, all this comes down to, I had all this experience uh, as a publicist working on film sets. I went to Showtime. And Showtime, as I got there, was shifting over to a movie format. They were right. doing a lot of original movies. So it was like being in a train station with these movie trains coming through. And I came to the conclusion that maybe I could get a movie made. Uh, which I tried before uh, on several occasions. Uh, getting a movie made is probably the most difficult thing anybody can do in life. That's uh, for sure. And it's very difficult, as you know. And um, I was on a set one day with, uh, with Joe Montaigne, the wonderful actor who we see on Criminal Minds, etc. And he and I are huge Chicago Cubs fans. And uh, we were talking about the Cubs. And I had seen his play a couple times called Bleacher Bums. Now, Bleacher Bums ran on Pico Boulevard in LA for 12 years in one theater. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful little slice of life play about the fans who follow the Chicago Cubs, who never win, the lovable losers, and they bet on every pitch, et cetera. And I turned to Joe at one point, I said, um, how come they never made a movie of Bleacher Bums? And he said to me, well, we tried, but there just wasn't any interest. Now, I'm at Showtime, they're making a movie a month, or excuse me, a movie a week. And uh, Jerry Offsay, the head of Showtime, is a baseball fan. So I was able to pitch the movie and they wanted to make it. So my first movie uh, was made in the, it was made a few months before 9-11. It was in the early part of 2001 that summer. We shot it up in Toronto. And that's how I started to get involved in putting movies together. From a little tiny equity waiver, less than 99 seat, Hole in the Wall Theater in West Los Angeles to an actual feature film. That's, that's a real stretch, isn't it? It is. And then, of course, we had enormous problems. And whereas they had gotten away with that play for years featuring, featuring uh, Cubs memorabilia and, and logos, uh, the minute we asked Major League Baseball that, that summer if we could you know, call the team the Cubs, because you have to ask permission, right? And you have yeah. to, get, you, to shoot in Wrigley Field. They said, no way. There's gambling in this movie. Now, it's not the players gambling. It's the fans gambling on whether it's a strike or a ball or a hit or a hit by pitch, whatever. But they wouldn't bend. Now, this is from the same organization that greenlit the Robert De Niro movie, The Fan, 
in San Francisco about a crazed killer, which had full <laughs> San Francisco Giants cooperation and was a dog of a movie. And we couldn't get cooperation. So I had to change the name to the Chicago Bruins. And they worked in Lakeside Park. And although the movie still worked, uh, the Chicago critics just killed us. Am I correct? Do I remember right that Mantegna wrote it with Dennis Franz? Exactly, exactly. And six or seven other unemployed actors one summer who, um, I think they were all Second City members, uh, or, or, or it may not have been Second City, it may have been a, a, um, uh, a play group, but yeah, they wrote Bleacher Bums one summer. Uh, and to this day, if you perform Bleacher Bums, the, the book has seven names on it. Wow, that's interesting. All right, so let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, clearly, you're, you're the expert's expert on James Bond and 007. You're the guy that people would go to if they really want to know the history of James Bond and what's gone on. Um, do you think that your military history background was what led you to Bond? Or what was it that attracted you to Bond in the first place? I certainly know what attracted me. What attracted you? Um, hormones. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. James Bond ruined me for years. I think that uh, my dad <laughs> used to come home from business trips and he always read Westerns. And I had absolutely no interest in reading Westerns. But one day, and I think it was in 63, I was a junior high school student. He plopped Goldfinger uh, down on my bed, a paperback uh -huh. of Goldfinger. And I said, uh -huh. what is this? I didn't know James Bond from anything. But at that time, those little paperbacks, those little colorful signet paperbacks started popping up on, on uh, desks in my classroom. And, uh, you know, you, you open Goldfinger and it's, it's kind of sexy. I'd never oh. read anything sexy in my life. Kind of sexy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, women in Ian Fleming novels always had magnificent breasts. I mean, it was just a thing. I'd never heard anybody referred to a breast as being magnificent, but certainly that had an impact on a 12-year-old. Um, and then a year later, the movie came out, Christmas 64. I went to see Goldfingers, one of the first movies I'd ever seen based on a book I'd just read. And wow. I mean, Goldfinger, I mean, it had an impact on me. So this is long before I started writing professionally, but the early Sean Connery Bond films were truly events. And when I was writing for Cinefantastique and I was starting to contemplate the combat films book, which sold about eight copies uh, for McFarlane, you know, <laughs> I said, I got to write about something that would sell some books. Because I was, I was a little bit of a, you know, uh, I, I wanted to make a little money for my writing. So... John Brosnan, who was a fine British author, had come out with a book back in the uh, early uh, 70s called James Bond and the Cinema, which was a tribute to James Bond. It was kind of a cool book because it had pictures from all the Bond films up until the first Roger Moores. And, um, but there was very little behind the scenes stuff. And having gotten such a response from the fans of Cinefantastic magazine for my retrospective articles, I said, Let's, let, me, let me see what I can do with Bond. So I opened the phone book again and got the number for MGM in Culver City, got a meeting with Albert R. Broccoli. Oh, really? Just, oh, yeah. cub, just Cubby Broccoli? Cubby Broccoli. Uh, well, I just wanted to see if uh, he would uh, lend any support to me because one of the things I've always felt is if you're going to write about a subject, you got to endear yourself to the key people. Otherwise, you're going to face the shutout. So... I get to Cubby Broccoli's office and he, I told him about my combat films book, which I believe had not come out yet. Cause it, did, I don't think that did was you, public. did you also tell him you'd been a, a publicist on set? No. Cause that was before. It was before. Uh, I did okay. not become an official publicist till 81 and this was 77. Got it. So this is four years. This is the, this is the summer of star Wars. Uh, so I was, head, I was headed to Europe to do my research because there's no way you can do Bond research in 77 from LA. This is pre-internet. So I had to go over there and interview people. And uh, he opened the door to me. He introduced me to his stepson, Michael Wilson. Mm. And in the summer of 77, Eon Productions opened their file cabinets to me. That's amazing. The, it was amazing. I got the call sheets from the first 10 films. They had just wrapped The Spy Who Loved Me. I got it over there just before just after they had wrapped so there was nothing left the 007 stage with those wonderful submarine pens you know yeah. from the fire in the interior of the 
the super tanker had been uh, wrapped, it was gone. But um, I remember vividly driving out to Pinewood for the first screening of The Spy Who Loved Me in a car with Michael Wilson and Ken Adam, who had designed all those wonderful sets. My goodness. And uh, we're sitting in the back of a Rolls Royce. I'm driving through London. I, I literally felt like royalty. And uh, from there, I just interviewed all sorts of people all over England. And uh, I was very nervous because in those days, I had a little cassette recorder with these audio tapes. And I would, every time I went through a um, airport x-ray machine, I had these fears that my audio tapes were being erased. But I put sure. them in a lead, lead bag and got them home OK and um, started writing and made one of the classic errors in uh, film journalism uh, and, and perhaps I shouldn't be faulted because I was so enthusiastic about my interviews. I had interviewed Terrence Young who had directed Dr. No from Rush With Love and Thunderball. I'd interviewed Richard Maybaum, the writer and Peter Hunt, the editor. And I was so enthusiastic about the information that I had this, the uh, interviews transcribed I decided to show them the Cubby Broccoli. Oh, oh. Look, at the, look at the good research I found. And Steve, if I could go back and just erase that moment, it did not, it, it, all I can say at this point is Cubby didn't like the fact that other people were taking credit or, or even just talking about the Bonds. He wanted to be the voice of Bond because uh -huh. he was producing solely at that time. Harry Saltzman had sold off his rights three years earlier because he had gotten in trouble with some stock from Technicolor mm -hmm. and it kind of drained his fortune. So it was only Cubby now. So he withdraws any more cooperation. Now, I didn't think there was a problem because I'd finished my research. But when it came time to get photographs to illustrate the first James Bond book about the behind the scenes, UA sent me a note, nothing, zero. Wow, zero. wow. And at that time, dear, dear sweet Fred Clark, who's the editor of Cine Fantastique, decides, because he, he, we're, we're close, and I tell him what's going on with the Bond book. He decides to take a full page ad out or half a page ad out in a magazine with Cubby Broccoli in a sniper scope window with a headline, who is this producer and why does he want this book stopped? And oh my God, you know, it was one thing that I lost cooperation, but just it was so bad now that I was, I was in the parking lot in front of the Thalberg building at MGM and I saw Michael Wilson and he yelled at me, cheap shot. And he, they were furious. Ugh. And I literally had nothing to do with that ad. I would have never done anything like that. So basically, uh, it was, let's see, that was 78, 79. And I had a book with no photographs. But then I started to count up the photographs I had. Originally, I had like 190 photographs in the book. And when I got rid of the ones that UA controlled, I had three. <laughs> but I, I, I decided to do a little research and I discovered something that was kind of like the Achilles heel of MGM. They would send photographs over to um, AP or UPI, the photo agencies, and those agencies would stamp on the back official AP wire photo and they would sell those photos to the public. Hmm. And as long as I wrote up, and these were all James Bond stills. So if I wrote the pic under the book, under the uh, photograph, UPI or AP photo, they couldn't touch me. Yeah, interesting. And I found photos from other sources. And then I was using kind of creative touches. For the chapter on Moonraker, I went to NASA and got some official photos of the space shuttle. They were in shuttle, the same shuttles that were in Moonraker, but they were space shuttles that looked just like them. Those became my publicity stills. So the, the book was kind of, kind of um, cut and paste illustrated, but it, it worked because I got enough good publicity stills from various sources that I was able to do the book. So, this, so essentially the book was unauthorized in every way. And, and none of my books have ever been authorized. Interesting, interesting. And so you've never gone and received permissions from Eon or anyone else to put stuff in these books? Well, just to um, add a little uh, footnote, this latest encyclopedia, which comes out in November, um, I went to United Artists. I told them who I was, because they have the international release, and they sent me the file. So I have some official UA stills in my book, um, but uh, now I have 400 pictures in my book. They're from uh, sources all over the world, 
everyone is sourced to a specific person who has that photo. But Chicago Review Press believes strongly that because of the fair use provisions, publicity stills can be published. And uh, I'm an historian. I, if I was doing a picture book where I was just featuring one bond still after another, mm -hmm. I probably would be vulnerable. But because I'm a formal film historian making points with my work, I'm allowed to have that kind of thing. Well, that's an interesting point. You're, you're falling under the educational aspect of the fair use doctrine of the copyright law. And Correct. it says that you can use that if you're educating in some way. And, and I've, you know, I've had the good fortune to read a, a pre-release copy of the book and it's magnificent. It's beautiful. And the pictures are, there's so many of them and so many cool pictures that, you, you know, I've never seen these pictures before. So you were, you did a really good job of putting the book together in a way that it, it looks and feels very accessible, very readable. Um, and, and, uh, and like I say, it's illustrated in just a fantastic way. How long did it take you to put all that together? What, how much time did you spend on this? How many months, years, whatever? Probably about two years. Two years. Uh, good year of rewriting. And I had to wait to see if I could get anything on No Time to Die. They've been very, very careful about plot details. It's, it's almost like they're under an MI6 uh, code of silence. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there is some stuff in there. I, you know, I got some stuff, especially the long history of how it took to get this movie made because there were some stops and starts. Um, and uh, I am I'm blessed with some illustrations from some wonderful illustrators. Jeff Marshall uh, is one of the illustrators and he gave me 12 or 13 wonderful paintings to put in the book, which I think not can knock your socks out. Um, uh, so a year of writing and then uh, another year to assemble all the photographs. I had uh, one of the things about my encyclopedia, the first one came out in 1990 and I, I was very appreciative. But when we did the two updates in 95 and 2003, the publishers were too cheap to re-alphabetize. So like the Pierce, Bra the Pierce Brosnan movies are shoved in the back, which was just insane. I apologize to the readers who were given that kind of short shrift. This book is an entirely new book in many ways. Yes, there are some of the entries from the previous encyclopedias, but it's complete, almost completely re-illustrated and a lot of new information. Also, Chicago Review Press kind of had me cut out some of the more uh, arcane material like signage and and certain things that are super trivia that probably weren't necessary so were there things that have been left out of the book that you wish were in no i don't think so i don't think so i think that um everybody who's anybody has an entry in the bond book in the encyclopedia i, I can i can v vouch for that you have people in there i went who? And then I go, oh, and th that's what's fantastic about it. There are people, I mean, I'm a big fan and you have people who worked on these movies that I, then when you explain who they are, you go, wow, they really did this, that, and the other thing that are very impressive thing. Oh yeah. Well, that goes back to a couple of things. My love of working on film sets and respecting the filmmakers. I really wanted to, everybody should have their moment in the sun if they can. And then uh, I just, um, love finding little bits of information, even things like when you're showing the credits of certain actors, where they previously worked with those actors. Right, you've got plenty of that in there. Right. The, the book's filled with, uh, this is what you know this character from, this or this actor from, you know them from this movie or that movie, or you know this uh, art director from this thing or that thing. Um, that's really great. I mean, it's oh, very yeah. helpful. One of my favorite stories is from, from Russia with Love. I was in England on that research trip and I was interviewing a production manager named Bill Hill, who was the production manager on From Russia With Love. And he told me that they were in desperate straits. They needed an actor to play the unfortunate agent that is knocked off by Robert Shaw's Grant character in the train station in Zagreb. Right. And uh, is replaced by Shaw. So Bill volunteered. So the production manager is that, uh, is that unfortunate agent uh, Nash, Captain Nash from MI6, that um, 
<laughs> he built, they'll say, this is kind of a ridiculous scene because, you know, you introduce me in the train station and then uh, I meet uh, Robert Shaw's character, Grant. We have the code signals exchanged and then we go to the bathroom together. And he said, you know, what we're actually saying, I need to go to the bathroom. You want to come with me first? It's kind of a ridiculous moment that Hill felt very ridiculous about. But that's, of course, where he gets knocked off. And, of course, Shaw arrives with his hat and briefcase. That's one of those Hollywood movie moments that you don't really think twice about until way after the fact. Right. It just happens. It's, it's there. They do it. You go, you don't even think about it. It's just something they're doing. Um, so, and movies are filled with that stuff. The Bond movies are filled with that kind of stuff. Why are they doing what they're doing? But you don't think about it till later. Oh, yeah. And in writing for the Bonds, and as I said earlier, I wanted to pick a subject that people really wanted to read about. And if you're going to write about a movie subject, you know, James Bond is, is kind of endless. I always joke that there are three things certain in life, death, taxes, and James Bond movies. Mm-hmm. If they ever drop the rights, excuse me, I'm going in and finding them. You know, sure. uh, well, well, it'll never happen. I, I have no doubt that we will have Bond movies into the 23rd century. Uh, I think you're correct. If, if they ever lose the, um, the copyright on it, all kinds of people will make James Bond movies. What would you say are the elements of a great Bond film? What makes every great Bond film work? I, I think there are specific elements that appear pretty much in every movie. What would you say those are? Well, um, you have to start with a script. I mean, if they're going to not do a good script, uh, it's going to show up later. I think the combination of a good script, the right bond, uh, for my money, Daniel Craig has been a terrific bond. I agree. Uh, the best bond movies have great villains. The worst bond movies have lousy villains. So, um, like for instance, uh, Skyfall was terrific. I thought Javier, Javier Bardem's character, Silva, was just a great Bond villain. Mm-hmm. But the previous film, Quantum of Solace, uh, I, I thought that uh, Matthew Amalric's character, Green, I thought he was just, um, he was like a businessman. You know, there was nothing, nothing really that interesting in him. I always go back all the way to my favorite Bond movie, Goldfinger. I mean, Goldfinger was the ultimate villain. You know, he was real and he was almost super real. Uh, th- I think that's right. He was about as real as they come and yet still slightly over the top. Right. And that's what makes a great Bond villain is when they are, when they chew the scenery and they're over the top, but they're not so far over the top that they become a literal cartoon for, for me. So it, it, to me, it's things like you're always going to have beautiful women. Um, you're always going to have some kind of chases going on. That's obvious you're going to have some kind of fights. There's always going to be fights. You're never going to have a Bond movie where they talk their way through the whole movie. Correct. Right. And, and, then, and music, you've got to have some good music and usually a very, very topical title song. I know the new one has Billie Eilish as the singer, the youngest singer to ever be featured in a Bond movie. Um, yeah, those are, those are the important qualities and certainly a good title helps. Um, but well, I think, and, maybe, and, and, and unmistakable opening notes to the music that are as iconic as any music opening, or, you know, any music in a movie it can be. Right. That mean, theme, the theme, which uh, is somewhat of a controversy of who created the James Bond theme. Um, why is that controversial? What, what happened? So the first James Bond movie was Dr. No. And uh, Monty Norman was brought on by the producers to do all the scoring. And from what I gather, Monty was very good with all of the traditional Jamaican music and all of that worked very nicely. And, but when it came down to have a theme, I think the producers were not entirely happy with what Monty had come up with. So they approached John Barry. Now John Barry uh, had started to score pictures. He was one of the first rock and roll band leaders in England. He had a group called the John Barry Seven. And so they handed John Barry a timing sheet, a couple of minutes long. John never saw Dr. No. Wow. He came up with his Bond theme without even seeing a Bond movie. He kind of reworked a couple of uh, ditties from his il- instrumental career, and they became the gist of, um, of the Bond theme. John Burlingame, a very fine writer of film history in Hollywood who specializes in music, has a great book out called The Music of James Bond, 
and anybody who's interested in, in that aspect of the film uh, should check it out. But from what my, I, I interviewed Barry at length uh, when I came back from London, and he told me the story that he, uh, he wrote it on a little time machine. At that time, he referred to a ditty of his called Bee's Knees, but I think Berlingamen uh, acknowledged that there was another little ditty that also contributed, the signature being a plucked guitar theme. Dun, 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 dun. So that was how he worked it out. But it's kind of odd that perhaps one of the most famous themes in music history was originated by someone who had no idea what Bond was. That's, that's, that's just crazy, you know, because it is absolutely part and parcel of the whole series. And it's one of the most identifiable parts of everything. And yet you're saying that, that the guy who created it had no idea what the movie was even about. I'm sure, I'm sure the bro Broccoli and Saltzman probably said it's a spy movie, spy blah, movie. blah, blah, blah. Right. And maybe he knew, you know, James Bond was fairly popular in England at that time. Um, so perhaps he knew a little bit about what the world of Bond was from maybe reading, but he had not seen the specific movie. So I don't think it's uh, probably unfair, Steve, to say that he didn't know anything. John probably knew a lot more than we're giving credit for and it inspired but he'd seen he'd you know, seen no footage though so he exactly. had, so he was being inspired by some fantasy of what it might be but not the actual thing right exactly uh, and, and certainly it's jazzy and it's got a it's not um it's it, it fits perfectly i mean that's just i guess serendipity that it would fit perfectly do you have a particular bond of the of the six known Bonds, not including the the extraneous ones, not including uh, Casino Royale in the in the seventies. Uh, was that seventies or the sixties? For Casino nineteen fifty four, Barry Nelson. Well, it's Barry Nelson, and I'm thinking of Casino Royale, the the comedy. Oh, you're talking spoof. about the spoofy Bond, yeah. sixty seven, uh, Woody Allen, Peter Sellers, um, and David Niven. I, I think that the it's axiomatic that you love the Bond you grow up with. So I grew up with Sean Connery's Bond. Yep. You and me both. He will always be Bond to me. But I say lately that I'm a huge Daniel Craig fan. I, I think I agree. wonderful. I agree. I, you know, they all have their pluses and minuses, though Connery is the, is the man to me. Do you, do you have a favorite movie? Is it Goldfinger? It's Goldfinger. You and me both. That's, that's it. The sound, uh, the sound went out at a screening once. And I remember not standing up, but sitting in my seat and doing the dialogue for about 30 seconds and people were appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's go and look at the book from a publication process. You've now done all this research. You've brought all this material together. You've figured out, you know, this is the alphabetization that you want to use. Um, you have reference. Well, your book doesn't exactly refer one thing to another, but things are referred to throughout the book, one thing to the other. Um, and once you have all that together and you know you've got all these pictures, you've got all this information, what then is the process you go through? Are you working with a publishing house or are they relying on you to do something with the material? Well, I don't write on spec anymore. I really, uh, having done three editions of the encyclopedia and having the rights to, to now have a fourth one with a different company, um, I was very fortunate a couple of years ago, I was able to... Um, uh, be introduced to a literary agent. And he had sold the Twilight Zone Encyclopedia at the Chicago Review Press, uh, which was challenging, by the way. I had a 54-page uh, proposal. Uh, see, I'm still writing very lengthy things. Of course. And, you know, the, the days of selling a book with a one-page cover letter ain't happening anymore. They want to know comparable titles, demographics, key subjects for press information. Mm. It's very lengthy in terms of how to sell a book these days because uh, it's just not easy. And uh, It's a so lot of work for free, isn't it? It's a lot of work for free, exactly. So I didn't start collecting the photos or even rewriting the book until I had the book sold. So once they gave me the contract, and gave me the advance. I started re. I, I I did a little preparatory work. I I had the I had to retype the whole encyclopedia from scratch because I didn't have the original. Uh, I didn't have the original files, but it's good because I could augment. And and having worked with them on the Twilight Zone encyclopedia, I know what they liked. They, they you know I know what they didn't like. So I was able to cut. Uh, like I say, it's a brand new book in many ways because the entries are all very different now. 
and differently illustrated as well. Are those the are those the major things that um, one today needs to have in your arsenal of abilities, your skill set um, to actually secure a publication? You need to be able to do those things. I think that any agent that's going to sell your book is going to need a document, a sales document. Now, doing a 54 pager for Twilight Zone Encyclopedia was probably an extreme thing. You could probably do it in 10 pages, but it has to have things in there like who is your target audience? Uh, what are some of the publicity hooks for how you can publicize the book? Uh, comparable titles that have sold and a good description of the book and its selling points. I think these are things I developed being a publicist because I was doing this for other people and promoting movies. Yeah, I would say that that's, I think that's one of the big advantages that you've had in your career is that you did the publicity. So you understood what it took to actually publicize a movie. So you had that kind of information in mind. And then on top of it, like you say, you write in a kind of a jaunty, um, snappy manner that's not, uh, that's not, uh, difficult to read. You can get into it and read it very, very easily. Um, th this book is going to be a beautiful book that it can sit on a coffee table. It is a coffee table book. Um, and so I'm just curious, did the, the, the publishers have um, restrictions on you for financial reasons in terms of publishing? Did they say, hey, we're going to do this in a full color book, but we want to eliminate X, Y, and Z because it's just going to be too costly? They said we couldn't do a hardcover. Uh, this, the, the, the book business has changed in many ways. I think it's more commercially viable to do a trade paperback hard, hard co uh, soft cover. Um, so, but they, they, I shouldn't call it a trade paperback. It's very high quality paper. I think the images are going to look terrific. Uh, like we like I said, we have they offered to do color, which was great. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in retrospect. It's probably better to have color than to have a hard cover because the color makes the book more competitive with the books that have been churned out from the official point of view. Because there, by the way, there was an official James Bond movie encyclopedia that my friend John Cork did, which had access to, of course, everything official. Uh, although I think my, my book is better because it's strictly alphabetized. His book kind of cuts around to different areas that are alphabetized in their own way. I, 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 I'm a strict encyclopedia guy. I, I like everything to be alphabetized. Well, it makes it easy to find things for sure. Uh, right. you, you know, uh, the, the book is not hard to find your way around in. Uh, and there are books like it where they are hard to find your way around in. You can't figure out where's what. Well, it's interesting because, you know, let's see if I can word this properly. It is a book. It looks like a book. It feels like a book. But I think of it as a celebration. If you're going to pick up my book, you're probably not going to read it from page one. You're going to go cut to Goldfinger or For oh, Your Eyes Only. Oh, for sure. Look something up. And if you have a sense of what do I need to know about Rick Von Neuter, who played Leiter in Thunderball, you look up Rick Von Neuter under V. It's, it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's designed that way. And uh, it's obviously the photograph. The photographs are the biggest selling point. As, as much as I, I think I've written some good punchy prose and good, great behind the scenes information, the photographs make the book. Well, it, what is a James Bond movie without exquisite imagery? So Exactly. And, and we've got some great images of the women. And I, I'll tell you, I'm most proud of the shots we chose for the greatest women on the planet of earth. Uh, you know, the, the shots of uh, Claudine Auger from Thunderball alone are worth the price of admission. Yeah, the, the, the pictures all the way through are quite wonderful. There's, there's nothing in the book that you go, why is that picture here? No, they're all, they are all great and they all belong there. And yes, it's not the kind of a book that you read from cover to cover. You just bounce around and look for things. Um, and, uh, and you can, you know, you can flip through the pages and find things and that then leads you to other things. And so, yeah, I think that the, the book is very well done from that perspective. All right, I want to switch gears for half a second and talk about screenwriting. You're also a screenwriter. Do you have a preference in terms of whether you're writing prose or, or screenplay? Do you have a preference? I think they're, uh, they're very, very different. Um, I have a great joy in working with my two writing partners. I write with two different guys. Uh, David Lee Miller, we write primarily animation uh, projects, and we have some good spec projects out there in the marketplace. 
the book that I did with David, The Cat Who Lived with Anne Frank, was an outgrowth of an animated feature we wrote and sold to a French conglomerate called Moon Scoop Paris. But they went out of business and we got the IP back. Um, the book is not really the movie because the book, the book, it's just a wonderful children's book. There really was a cat who lived in the attic with Anne Frank. It was Peter's cat. And we tell her story from the cat's point of view. Mm. The movie is Mushi's story. Mushi crawls out of the attic every day and becomes a member of the Dutch animal resistance. So it's a little bit of a revenge <laughs> fantasy story where our <laughs> villains are the Nazis, but they're personified by a big Rottweiler named Blitzkrieg and his two uh, German shepherd henchmen. <laughs> and you're, you're trying to get that made as an animated movie? Animated feature, it's currently in play. Uh, we have a lot of sizzle around it, we haven't sold it yet. And then um, uh, we also have a series uh, pilot for a spoof of Rod Serling's world called Starling, which is also out there in play. Uh, it presupposes that Rod Serling never really died. He's still living in Hollywood behind some gates. And what, what is he, a friend of Elvis? Well, he, he <laughs> probably knows Elvis, but he's involved in interdimensional travel and he's adopted some interesting children, including a little girl who's now a teenager who has a thing on her back where you pull it out and she says, my name is Talkie Teen and oh, I'm oh gonna yeah. kill you. Oh yeah, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would you say, from your perspective, what makes a good story good? Well, that's a great question. Um, well, in trying to sell stories to Hollywood, I think you've got to try to be as novel as possible, something different. I'm not the guy who's going to write the 87th vampire movie. I just don't, I won't do it. I mean, I got to write something that I, if it comes out, people will say that's unique or different. I mean, we just wrote a, well, my comedy writing partner, Billy Reback and I, we just wrote a spoof of the great courtroom drama, 12 Angry Men, you know, Henry Fonda, 1957, kind of an iconic movie. We wrote it as a comedy called 12 Anxious Men. These jurors, just to tell you the tone of the piece, two of the jurors are conjoined. So that should tell you what kind of story this is. <laughs> it's wild and wacky, but I don't think anybody's ever contemplated that. So we, we try to be unique, but a good story, I think, starts with a unique hook and um, great characters who are involved. And I, I mean, I'm probably not going to be your writer who's going to write a deep emotional drama about relationships. I'm kind of a genre guy. I like comedy. I like Westerns. I like science fiction. I like horror. Um, uh, I, I'm particularly a fan of time travel. And several of our projects are unique time travel stories. Uh, they're doing time travel again, but they seem to be doing mostly dramatic other than, of course, uh, Bill and Ted. Sure. Well, you, you, you know, what you're talking about in all these various genres that you're, uh, you have uh, some kind of a fascination with, it's all what I call entertainment versus edutainment. And right. uh, I, you are clearly into, into the kinds of things that I'm into too, which are purely entertainment, but yet in some way, there has to be something underlying each of those. I don't think you can just do fluff it has to have some depth of meaning to it. It doesn't have to have necessarily a message, but there should be some depth to the characters. There should be a goal involved. Well, yeah. I agree with you. In fact, um, that's the big challenge in coming up with a great concept. Do you get to know these people? Do they come across at least in their own universes as real people in their mm -hmm. way? And th that is a great challenge. I think that, um, uh, but I also think particularly since I'm writing comedy, that the movies have to be funny. Well, that's, find, that's a good thing to have in a comedy. Oh, yeah. I find that a lot of comedies are, are not funny. I mean, I, I, I love to laugh. I think, the, boy, I'll tell you right now, we could use a lot of comedy in America. No kidding. Who needs to laugh. We, we're, uh, we're recording this, you know, I think it may be obvious to the listeners, we're recording this in uh, the fall of 2020, and we're still in the middle of... Uh, a, a pandemic of, with COVID because people may be listening to this two, three years from now. Um, but we're in the middle of this very dour period in America, in the world for that matter. And yeah, you want comedy. We need comedy. We, we need uplift because things are kind of dour right now. 
Um, tell me what in, in today's world, even though um, things are very challenging right now in show business and in Hollywood in particular, um, what are a few things that you can suggest for up and coming filmmakers that will help them to secure a chance at a sale? What are the things that you think about when you're preparing to pitch something? That's just the $64,000 question. Sure. I think that, um, well, there's a couple of things. Um, get to know directors in any way, shape or form. Mm. I find that even though people will tell you they'll read your script, I find having a director of some note telling you they like it and might want to direct it. And this is a great challenge. I mean, there are probably only a, a handful of directors of note. And I'm not saying to go to the Martin Scorsese's and the Steven Spielberg's of the world, uh, but there are directors who work every day, particularly television directors. Having a director attached to your project probably helps people make a decision on it. Mm -hmm. I have this theory that when you send a screenplay to a company, whether it's a network or a stream or a studio, it goes on a pile. And I'm sure the most prioritized pile are the ones that have financing attached, have a director attached, have a star or two attached, and those get decided on right now. And then if you see the pecking order, some of them have directors attached and some have some money attached, but then you have the scripts that are sitting there all by themselves. Now, unless it's being submitted by a George Clooney or a Brad Pitt that has a production company that believes in it, it's very difficult to get people to buy something. I think that you can continue to submit screenplays to people. There's also two types of movies. There's the studio level mainstream movie, or we can call it a streamer movie because obviously the streamers are picking up the slack, which is a movie of budget. We're talking about a movie probably in addition to $5 million. Anything under 5 million, and I could argue that maybe even under a million qualifies as more of an indie, uh, then it's a whole different story. Then having those directors uh, is more meaningful because the movie can kind of start shooting tomorrow. That's another mm -hmm. thing. If you give them a good script and you have a director that's interested and has vetted it, and when a director who has credits has vetted your screenplay, that's a big plus, I believe. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it tells the, the buyer that we could start shooting this. Now, it's not entirely across the board true. I mean, there are people who still sell spec scripts, but I think it's an exception. Uh, I think it has become very much the exception. And I don't think the studios are looking to spend money on specs. They're looking to spend money as like you say, on things that are good to go. And it's it called packaging. 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 Yeah, sure. It's kind of become a, a buzzword, you know, uh, the, the, the sad fact and being a producer going out into the marketplace every day, trying to packaging, there are this many producers and I'll stretch my hands past your screen. And there are this many actors and directors who are meaningful. So it's very challenging to attract people of note because of the, the reason they're people of note is they've got 10 or 12 of their own things going. Of course. So well, it's all, I often feel like I'm the orphan walking in the door asking for some soup, you know, like in that scene in Oliver, you know, <laughs> Can I have some more soup. <laughs> well, uh, I think that you're in the same boat with the, um, 150,000 other screenwriters that are out there trying to sell something that don't have an attachment to anything. So you've got to go out and figure out how to get there. And even when you do, so, I mean, you can go to look at the Spielbergs or, or at Eon Productions, you know, better than anybody, all of the various struggles that they've had in spite of the fact that they're one of the most successful producing organizations ever. And they are a billion dollar organization and they still struggle to get movies made. So if they're struggling to get movies made, who, who are we? So therefore you have to find these edges that you're talking about. Oh, sure. Now the other thing is to make something small. The reason I mentioned that 12 anxious men script logistically, that movie's a doll. It's one room. Yeah. And uh, with the technology available today with cameras, you could practically shoot a movie on your iPhone. People have done it. Uh, if you want to be a filmmaker today, Go out and make your film. Robert Rodriguez, the great filmmaker who did El Mariachi 20, 30 years ago uh, for almost nothing, told me this 20 or 30 years ago, and I should have listened to him then. Just go make your movie. 
don't <laughs> don't go looking to sell it to somebody. Just go make it. Now, obviously, you're not going to make Gone with the Wind on a dollar and twenty five cents. Of course. But if you've got a good idea and you've written it well and you've got great characters, people will work with you to achieve your vision. And then when the movie gets distributed to maybe a film festival, if you're lucky, or wherever, it puts you up above everybody else. And I think that if I was going to give one piece of advice to budding filmmakers is go make your movie on any level you can possibly make it and get it out into the mainstream. And then you are a filmmaker because you made it. Well, okay. So let, let, uh, we're, we're slightly over an hour and it's been a, just, a, just a fantastic bunch of um, wonderful stories and uh, how you know, you've dug through and, and come up with all, all this information about the Bond movies is remarkable to me. I, I just, I'm fascinated by it. Um, do you have a, a story that you can lend us from all of your experiences that's either quirky or offbeat or weird or just plain funny? Well, I've told it a couple times. Some of your listeners might have heard it, but uh, when I was researching the Twilight Zone encyclopedia, I became very close with Carol Serling, Rod's widow. I would go up to Pacific Palisade. She'd open her files for me, much like the Bond people did in London that year. Uh, I'd get the contracts. I knew how much people got paid for their various uh, jobs on the Twilight Zone. I think top salary on a Twilight Zone episode those days was $5,000, which <laughs> seems like nothing today. Uh, but I was interested in the regimen in which Rod, Rod worked. So she pointed me to uh, his personal copy of his collected live screenplays from the live, the live days on, you know, on a live television. Right. Things like Patterns and Requiem for a Heavyweight and The Comedian. And they had been bound and published as a book. And she pointed out that his preface talked about how he wrote his regimen, what he was inspired by and what his day to day was like. So she handed me the book and I brought it home. And I was going to look at it that night. And my wife called and said we had some kind of uh, dinner to go to. So I left it on my desk, figuring I'll come back to it and I'll read more about Rod. I got home that night and the book had vanished. Wow. Now, no, nobody had broken into our house. There was no sign of any type of illegal entry. Steve, I looked for that book for three days. There was only one place it could be. It was sitting on my desk. I'm in the office right now. And I do not know what happened to that book to this day. Huh. And it was very embarrassing for me because I had to call Carol Serling up and tell her that I lost her husband's book his own personal copy, even though it wasn't signed, thank God. And I was able to go on eBay and find the exact same book for $100, which I was very glad to pay. So I went back to Binghamton for a Twilight Zone symposium. And Nick Parisi, who's written a book on the Twilight Zone and Rod Serling, offered to show me where Rod lived and the home house he grew up in. So we're standing outside the home. The owner comes out and offers to take a picture of the two of us sitting on the porch. I hand her my iPhone. She takes the picture goes back in and I look at the picture, it's in black and white. Now, huh? I, I have no idea how that happened because, you know, you take a standard iPhone picture, if you want to take a black and white picture, you have to go into the settings to make it a black and white picture. Right. So that was... You know, I recently, I hadn't seen it in forever and I decided I wanted to check out Seven Days in May. And I... And, I didn't remember that he wrote that. Just extraordinary. Just one of my all-time favorite. One of my all-time favorite movies. Rod's style of writing, which he perfected on the Zone, was going out of style. Well, it's it still out of style. It's still out of style. It's not about the dialogue. I'm lamenting all the time now that where's the quotable dialogue we remember from our youth. Rod was very dialogue centric in his stories. It wasn't about the great visuals. It wasn't, it, it, there were certainly moments that, you know, turn your head and they were surprises, but it was really about the characters and the dialogue. And if you look at television in the sixties, his show was replaced by shows like Gilligan's Island and the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah, no, no kidding. Well, his storytelling was all about ideas masked in some form of entertainment. And it was always about, not always, but it was frequently about some form of political undertone or some kind of moral undertone or ethical undertone. And yet it was portrayed within these delightful 
fun, sometimes scary, sometimes eerie stories that usually had a fantastic twist at the end. He, he, do you know any author that, that had more great twists than him? No, I think he was inspired by the great short story writer, O. Henry. O. Henry, sure. Uh, and uh, Rod was very frustrated with live television because, uh, you know, he, he re very much wanted to tell the Emmett Till story about that young black, uh, young, young man who was hanged for whistling at a white woman in the South back right. in the 50s. And uh, he was told pointedly by an executive with the network that you can tell the story, but you got to make him a Mexican. And he was outraged by that. He just did the interference by um, sponsors and networks and uh, people who wanted to change his stories. I think at one time he had a, a story on the air about politics, but you couldn't talk about anything controversial. So it just ripped the guts out of his script. And he would be amazed by the way, what's shown on television today. I think that television has gone through another renaissance in many ways. But uh, I think if he was alive in the political sphere right now, ooh, boy. I well, think, there's, uh, there's really nobody, there's nobody like him to this day. I mean, he was a unique, uh, thoughtful k k writer of great stories. I mean, there was, there's still nobody quite like him. Um, I, I had the great privilege when I was in school a million years ago to take two semesters of playwriting from one of the great radio playwrights of all time, Norman Corwin. And he had the same ability to tell these incredible stories, but not like Serling. Serling was one of a kind. There's nobody been like him prior to him or since him. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, by the way, Corwin was one of uh, Rod's idols. I think well, I, I know that he, I know that that, that Rod yeah. admired Cor well, Cor Norman Corwin. He, he was the gentlest, sweetest, most wonderful human being. I got to know him quite well. Um, and he just, and by the way, he didn't have an advanced education. He taught himself how to do all those things and his language abilities and his ability to tell a story and have some sort of an, a notion wrapped in that story was, was outstanding. I mean, it was, um, uh, in some ways haunting, but not really. Norman was not a haunting writer like like Serling could be. Norman was more of a humanist, although Serling was too, but his but Norman's stories were very human, were very down to earth and human. Right. But always there was something under them that we don't see so much anymore. Although we still, t t as you say, we've had a renaissance in TV and um, for, to our good fortune, there are some really spectacular writers working today. Yes, and networks that are brave enough to feature those stories. Right, sure, exactly. Well, you know, they're trying to fill huge numbers of hours at this point, so right. they have to do it. Uh, they have to put something in there. Why not make it great? Why, you know, don't cheap it out, make it great. And fortunately, we, we are seeing some of that. Well, this has just been a, just a marvelous um, hour and I don't know how many Thank minutes you, at this Steve. point. For Steve, me too. I, I greatly appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing all this great information with uh, our listeners. So I, I, I just thank you profoundly. Well, I, I find a kindred spirit in you as well. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.